Well, I'm really glad that I got uh, Marcy. You know, the reason I haven't been around is that you might know this. I uh, serve on the medical school executive committee. It's a big deal, but it's it's a standing meeting on Thursdays from 11 to 1. That's and not the very only nice reason I'm here is that they canceled it because we didn't have a quorum. <laughs> I was there has to be a quorum, that. and there's only seven members of the committee, so if somebody's traveling, it's true. I think we can start whenever. Oh, go ahead. You want to go ahead? I do will. That would be great. Well, listen, I mean, uh, you know, one could go with a long introduction or a short. I'm going to try to cut it in the middle because Johnny is such an engaging person that we don't want to take too much time. Uh, and you really could. Oh, goodness. Um, you know, I just had the great pleasure of uh, being in Singapore with Johnny for four days. Uh, boy, did we have a lot of fun. Uh, Johnny's a remarkable individual, actually, because he's really somebody who's committed, fully committed to translation, has, uh, has had feet in both worlds of academia and industry, you know, his whole career. And uh, he's kind of he's a Californian guy, telling me some great stories about growing up with his dad. You know, and he went to the uh, University of California instead of Santa Barbara. Got another grand there, one of the beautiful towns in the U.S. Was hoping to. That's it. And then did a uh, did his PhD at UC San Diego, another fantastic place, close to home. And then went up the street. Uh, Iowa Warren up to Palo Alto, where he had the honor and privilege to be a postdoctoral fellow with the great Dr. Roger Kornberg, recipient of the really great, great gentleman of science. Yeah. Son of, a true gentleman, yeah. Son of Arthur Kornberg. You know, it's, it's pretty amazing when you have a father and son of Nobel. Um, Johnny uh, uh, went to North Carolina, Central University. Uh, you know, by this point, he had met his lovely wife, Kelly Sexton, who's our Associate Vice President of uh, Technology of Research and Technology Transfer. So he has the enviable, the enviable uh, you know, the way he said it was, and I thought it was very cute, he was a trophy husband. As opposed to trailing yeah. spouse, right? His trophy yeah. husband is a little, a little better. Yeah. We often, but we certainly have benefited. One of my best friends here in the university was a trailing spouse of Jim Baker, who became a world famous guy when Lisa was hired. Cool. Uh, Johnny's been um, taking on some very big institutional responsibilities having to do with. Uh, I threw foot drug screening and drug repurposing, and Teresa tells us about his, uh, his involvement with, uh, you know, uh, that kind of activity, uh, uh, coordinating with Michar and the life sciences. He's got a, also got a new R01. He left North Carolina, he was an associate professor. Now he's like, uh, an assistant professor in the GI division and also in the um, medicinal chemistry. Soon to be promoted. And my feeling is you'll see this guy go up like a rocket ship. So, Johnny, what, all, the only thing I can say is that uh, he is also, and this is important, he's a, he's, a, he's a kind of a virtuoso banjo and ukulele player, which is big just my life. <laughs> And he's also a serious pizza chef. So with all those, so I think I did it. Maybe I went long. Thank you. Welcome, Johnny. We're glad to have you. <laughs> Thank you. That was awesome. That was probably the best introduction I've had. <laughs>
it's been a um, it, it's it's I'm super happy to be here to talk to you today. Um, and uh, and thanks to Brian. I'm I'm new to University of Michigan in my um, uh, trailing spouse slash um, trucky husband role. I get to pick up and move every once in a while, and it's a great job. It's the best job I, I have. And uh, and so I'm I'm just I'm just sprouting roots here uh, at, at Michigan, and, and I want to tell you about some work that's all been done here at Michigan. And so you know the lab has just been up and running for um, gosh not even a year and a half. We've really been at it for about a year because I know the service contract on my microscope we just had to re up. Mm -hmm. So that's that's when I know we've, we've been here exactly a year. So um, anyway, <clears throat> I wasn't sure about the. The, the audience and what content. So please stop me if you want to, um, you know, if you want to dig in specifically uh, to, to any topic. I thought what, what I was going to do is I'm going to sort of describe what cell painting is. This is, it's nothing new, really. It just had a good marketing spin from Ann Carpenter. We've been doing this kind oh, yeah. of high content um, screening, which started off as very directed, you know, asking very directed questions to um, more broad morphologic characterization and then uh, we've been doing that for about eight years now and then um, and then Anne's group put this nice cell painting kind of spin on it and really sort of formalized it into a uh, into a method and uh, and so um, you know we, we we were on the bandwagon but we we, we changed our branding and it, it's really a great uh, a great technique so I'm going to tell you about um, you know sort of our general approach to cell painting the kinds of things that we can do with it but first I really I just wanted to introduce the concept. I don't know how um, familiar with um, uh, drug discovery and drug development everyone is here. Um, I know there's people with deep experience here um, in this, but um, for those of you who don't know, um, drug discovery and drug development is getting harder and harder. And this is um, this is E Room's law. So this is the number of billions of dollars it takes to get one drug. Um, and so it, it's it, so e, this is E Room's law. So E Room's law is actually just Moore's law spelled backwards. Did so, everybody know that? Moore's law, you know. Yeah, the, this is important. Yeah. <laughs> so it's the inverse. So instead of like this, it's going like this. Even. And it's a long block, so it's exponential. It's a mess. Yeah, yeah. And, and so uh, it's just getting, you know, more, it's it's getting worse and worse. Uh, and so one of the approaches that, that we commonly turn to is drug repurposing, where we're looking for new indications for old drugs. And so um, we've just recently launched the Center for Drug Repurposing here. Um, it's, it was a Mishar initiative, and um, uh, Sam Handelman's been involved in that, and uh, he's the director of uh, clinical informatics. And um, and so we're, we're, we're just launching that program, and a big part of that is our drug repurposing library. Um, but just to give you a quick example, you know, thalidomide. Uh, everybody knows about thalidomide. It caused uh, horrible birth defects, and it was used in the – in the 1970s to treat um, nausea in pregnant women. And uh, there was no, you know, no, no studies were done, uh, you know, in terms of the developmental um, um, toxicity that, that were, were possible in the context of treating pregnant women. And so they found out that, um, you know, posed some serious problems. So the drug was shelved for a long, long time. And then, um, and then a company called Celgene picked it back up and they figured out that uh, it was a good anti-cancer drug uh, for uh, AML. And uh, they hung a little bit of spinach off right here, and you can see this is thalidomide, and that's that's a medicinal chemistry technical term. Um, <laughs> spinach, that's spinach, right, Jesse? So yeah. The amino groups. The primary amino. Yeah. No, well, I mean, anything can be spinach, really. It's just, uh, and, and and this is an eight billion dollar annual cash cow for them, and then Celgene, you know, got acquired and everything like that. So this shows you that that there's still uh, there's there's a lot of promise in in old use in new uses for old drugs. And that um, very often you don't have to. Uh, they can also be good starting points for uh, for for drug development camps, right? And this is the conventional process where you start off with you know target discovery. What is the therapeutic target you're after? Could be a molecular target, could be a phenotypic target. And then once you have validated that target, you go into high throughput screening. Uh, you could do virtual screening. You can do fragment based screening or combinatorial libraries. You know we've done the whole gamut. And uh, uh, basically you're trying to detect you know, compounds that, that do what you want them to do, produce the phenotype that you want. And then that's where you collect those hits and you get it together with the medicinal chemist and you look at their at their developability and that's when you move from sort of the hit to lead stage and then go into lead optimization. And that's where you have molecules that work. You probably have in vivo proof of concept at that point. 
and what you want to do now is 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 in, is 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 improve the the, the drug like characteristics, the metabolism, the distribution, all that, all add me talks. And so um, uh, this is a big funnel like this. So you start off with you know sometimes we'll screen um, you know it, it, big pharma conventionally screens you know millions of compounds. Um, we generally screen something like hundreds of thousands. And uh, but with more complex biological systems. We can screen, you know, we, we, we screen less because the th throughput's usually a little lower. But anyway, this is a funnel that leads down to preclinical development, ultimately in clin clinical trials, and then there launch. There could be an informatics-based pre-screen in the big library, so you could do a screening step with the informatics and look at the huge library and take it down to yeah. your thing. When That's you one of the big value adds right. for this drug repurposing library. There's so much known about these yeah. compounds. And that, that pulling all of that information together out, you know, at, at the outset is really important. Not to mention that you can take all these molecules and document all the known pockets in PDB. So Heather Carlson's done that in our department in uh, in medicinal chemistry, and and so they can we can predict. And she's been involved you know, from the pockets. beginning of bioinformatics. Yeah. That trained with two of our first students. Yeah. Way back. Yeah. So we're working together on exactly that that component. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that's a little bit about the center of drug repurposing. We've got discovery phase of which we're. We built this um, drug repurposing library. It's about 5,000 compounds right now. They cover all target classes, uh, and this is kind of the breakdown in terms of therapeutic area, right? So, uh, neurology, psychiatry is number one. So, lots yeah, of drugs. There. A question about that one, yeah. uh, because you know, this is well known the, um, the neuropsych that way pathway uh, drug companies that just shut down all the vision. I don't know, Lily was the latest. Terrible. So there's such a need that there's so few compounds. Yeah. So that what makes that a huge opportunity. And then there's another graph that shows, you know, the need is way out here, but the investment is so <clears throat> not there. So there's yeah. a force multiplier. So where did you get those? I mean, I, I, where did those come from? So the library that we built, all the compounds are commercially available, and you so just decided to do it. Yeah, so we decided to collect them and then assemble them, uh, annotate them, and build an electronic resource that um, is going to, you know, help people to mine, uh, you know, this. It's, it's basically a one-stop shopping for the sort of informatics resources here plus the physical collection. So these compounds, they're in three, 384 oil plates. We have a copy in my lab. We have a, a copy in the CCG, and they're available for screening, and you can go screen them right now. And so they're 10 millimolar in DMSO. Uh, we just got an echo machine, so Mishar and LSI kicked in to buy a $800,000 liquid handling machine so that we can um, dispense picoliter droplets of the drug to whatever cell plates that we want. And uh, so we're fully set up and screening. We've screened about, about 16 assays through this now. So four of those were in my lab, but the others were, were in, uh, you know, just people walking in the front door to Do the um, CCG. Um, the comp yeah. But That's the problem we talk about later. Yeah, yeah, they're 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 in they're in DMSO, um, but we have the ability to to we have powder backups for lots of these compounds, and if there's a a, a rationale to um to to not have DMSO present, it stimulates neuro D1. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Neuro development, so it's <coughs> a huge noise signal. Yeah, yeah. We can always collect subsets of compounds and then assemble them. You know, we have powder backups. <coughs> So we can solubilize them for a specific need like this. That's and that's one of the things we always do in assay development is just to check the DMSO tolerance. Excellent. Thing. And so, um, so that's a, a the informatics resource. And so here's a, a little bitly URL. So if you want to write that down, you can actually download the molecules in our library, and that has the smiles codes and um, and a brief annotation about mechanism of action. And so um, it's it's a not a too big CSV file. So all you have to do is just Open it up, and then you know you can render the structures in a uh, whatever package you want. But there's names, and there's some smiles codes, and some sort of brief MOA there. But anyway, this is the vision for the um, for the informatics resource that we're developing now that we're going to launch uh, fairly soon. Oh, this is a really cool one, Brian. You're going to love this. Yeah. Oh yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. Well. So, um, so th this doesn't exist anywhere. In any any screening center uh, is just absolutely does not exist because of the perceived um, trouble that it's going to cause you in building this library, and so we're you know either 
um, stubborn or naive or I don't know, gluttons for punishment. But we're we're in the process now. We set aside one hundred and eighty thousand dollars to uh, to collect these nine hundred and fifty compounds, and they're all sort of substances of abuse. And um, I I got George Meshur hooked with the with he's like you're gonna buy a hundred hallucinogens. He's like where do I sign? Like he's the one who <laughs> signs up. He's like it's just fantastic. And so that, you know, and the funny thing is, is that we buy analytics so. So we have to be DEA, uh, a DEA licensed, right? And um, and so we're getting some of them from Cayman Chemical right up the street here, but also from the NIDA Drug Supply Program and a couple of other well, sources. The part is that we're seeing a lot of positive effects from using psilocybins and LSDs and the various things in very small doses are helping us with treatment resistant depression. And we're having to relearn that science and after a decade likely, of, uh, of. It will likely you know, be uh, one no of research. the. Uh, I would predict within even five to ten years that uh, it will be a treatment of choice for uh, breaking people out of the uh, prison of treatment. Depression that because yeah. and, P and PTSD as well. Yes, in PTSD there's been a lot of uh, good good uh, initial data on the logo psilocybin. Remarkable, uh, yeah. So this is really uh, quite uh, quite futuristic, not the least of which was the cannabinoid stop uh, coming on with the recreational marijuana. Mm -hmm. yeah. when, you, when, you let your, when you let your graduate students make this figure for you, of course, they're going to make the cannabinoid slice of the pie green, right? <laughs> <laughs> was that, is that Reef? You would think. So, yeah, so um, this is just such an important... It's, it's interesting. So, so we're awaiting our Schedule One license, so we don't have all the Schedule One compounds yet. But like when we get LSD, it's really interesting. So we get kind of the standard, and we have an analytical license. And an analytical license allows us to buy like a milligram of these substances. A milligram of LSD is a would be a heroic journey for everyone in this room. <laughs> <laughs> and so it, yeah, it be, like just because cool, it's yeah. it's microgram, yeah. hopes, you know, it's like you know microgram dosages are like a. 100 microgram doses, I think, a heroic of, of LSE that's going to oh, leave a permanent effect. Also, look at the opioids and substance use disorders and these kinds of things. There's playoff, for example, hallucinogens, small doses, or ketamine. There's good evidence that um, when you treat a patient that are, is addicted to, say, opioids, with those drugs, their need for those drugs falls by tenfold. There's also just recent data, Sam was pointing this out last week, uh, there's uh, work in England that people who were treated with low doses of that, in this case ketamine, uh, reduced their dependent need for uh, alcohol by a factor of 10. Yeah. So it's a way to break people out of alcoholism. And, and also nicotine as well. Yeah. It's also been established in nicotine, which is I think the most addictive drug. And so, um, you know, and this goes. There's a there's a tradition of that with ayahuasca as yeah. well, where there's you know, uh, kind of a history of it being a, a, a real addiction breaker. It's 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 mm -hmm. it's really interesting phenomenon. It's gonna it's gonna be very interesting well, in the next five years to see what the FDA does about that because the the clinical trials are sort of unequivocal, huge effects at this point. So they're gonna have to address it, and they're gonna have to um, they're gonna have to approve because they're just not harmful. And that there's there's no adverse effects, you know, very 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 rare. So um, anyway, that's this is a really neat resource that we're building. We hope to have it online fairly fairly soon. And that's just going to be another library that you, you that you can screen in the CCG or in you know in the Center for Drug Repurposing. And you don't need to go through any of the regulatory burden because we've all done the the DEA licensing and everything. So we'll dispense it, and then you guys can screen it, and it's uh, it's 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 a it's a good deal, right? Okay, now, so this is our technology platform. So the area is called high content screening, and it's basically automated um, fluorescence microscopy. And um, and so what it is, it's it's a method of of, uh, of imaging both cells and tissue um, at various different levels of resolution, depending on what your needs are. And uh, you can get these you know very beautiful images. These are a couple of uh, cancer-associated fibroblasts, labeling you know a couple of different colors here, and then. The point of this is, is that we get these beautiful images of cells, and we need to delineate regions of interest. So here are the nuclei. That's the cytoplasmic mass. That's the mask of a protein called vimentin. This was from my uh, colleague, uh, Rochelle Bonica in, uh, in GI. Um, she, we just published a paper together on this vimentin study. 
where we were looking at a, a, a particular mutation causing a collapse of the, the cytoskeletal structure. We were able to, to turn sort of uh, qualitative assessments of images into a very hard and very robustly quantifiable uh, phenotype. So it was, it was really a neat thing. And we did that by looking at the radial distribution of the, um, of, of the signals in all of these different respective channels. And so um, we looked at you know, cross-correlation between these image channels. And so we started with these beautiful images, and then we come up with, uh, you know, for each one of these cells, we measured about 2,000 um, features. And so that's our feature vector is about 2,000. Now, lots of those are highly redundant, and so we go through feature printing, and we get down to the set of, you know, uh, you know sort of the core feature vector, and then, um, and then we're able to, to do uh, all the machine learning and, you know, anything we want to do with that, with that feature vector. So um, it's relatively quick and easy and cheap to get into this business. So this is a CX-5. Justin's got one, right? I have one. Alan Sparka has one. Um, Nuri Nimadi has one. There's like, there's like five or six of these on campus, right? But I'm going to tell you a secret. Not, this is not Justin's. Most of these machines sit idle. We have two of them in our lab. And this could service a group of 50. Um, and so what that means is we have bandwidth, right? So um, anyway, we have, a, uh, we have a CX-5, and we also have an array scan. So CX-5, it's about 80,000, but did you pay more than that? Or did, no, okay, good. Um, <laughs> they, they told me they were giving me the Johnny Sexton discount, but apparently I got the... Uh, I negotiated with the Johnny the Sexton discount. Did you? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's good. That's good. <laughs> I thought I got the Justin Colosino discount, but... Okay. Um, so we have we have two of the Thermo Fisher machines. This is the machine that we're planning to get. So this is a million dollar four camera system. It does confocal, super high resolution. It has immersion objectives. So most machines that you'll bump into on campus, no, all of them you'll bump into on campus have dry objectives. So that means the practical limit's 40x, um, and so you can go up to about a 40x 1.2 NA objective. And that's good enough for most things, but, but sometimes we need to go up to, you know, 63x or 100x immersion objective and get really, really high resolution. So um, these machines are about um, between 700,000 and a million bucks, depending on how many cameras you have. And these can go really high throughput because you acquire four different colors uh, of illumination at the same time. And so this is the cell painting machine because in, in two pictures, um, in two acquisition cycles, you can get eight colors. And the machine's got like five lasers and, um, and, and multiple, you know, lots of laser lines. So this is really a machine that we're going to try to get through hook or crook, like probably a, a shared yeah, instrument yeah, grant. We're so gonna we'll, we, we, we can talk. We're going to get one. Yeah, of these. it's, it's going to happen. So we, we're working on it right now. Uh, yeah, so the eight colors, but then that can multiplex into how many colors? It's, it's really... Um, there's a, a limit to the amount of, of, uh, of spectral density that you can, you can get. I mean, we have methods for compensating. This machine also sends different colors through different pinholes in the NIPCOW spinning disk. And so this machine's really good at, at, um, at packing as many dyes into the spectral zone as you can. So, if, you know, you have eight excitation colors here. If you have wide stoke shift dyes, you can just go out there. You can excite them all with one with one laser, and you can you can detect them all, all the way out there. Not to mention all the conventional dyes. So you can get up to very highly multiplex probe sets. Um, you're going to have times where there's overlap, and as long as you understand what those signals are, you, you can address it that. for sure. It's just like compensation and flow cytometry. Mm -hmm. So very. So this is a trick that we do. We will have um, a dye that's the same color, but one of the objects that it stains is out in the cytoplasm or at the membrane, and the other one's in the nucleus. It's a twofer, right? And so we can do double duty on certain colors, and so we can actually, you know, double the information content. But there is a practical limit, right? And that's, you know, 8 to eight to 10 colors um, where we can get good information out of each channel, right? That's really what we want to do is maximize the amount of information from each channel. Even though um, we've done a study and a collaborator, we basically have done effectively the same study where um, – we can mix five or seven different cell types together and be able to identify them with machine learning with nearly 100% precision using a random forest classifier with a single die. And that's just with the Hirsch stain or the DAPI stain. Yeah, it's and so remarkable. it's remarkable. I mean, yeah. I was blown away by that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Can you do small samples of tissue? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So normally in this in this format, we, when we take tissue, we disperse tissue, and then we um, we plate it as as an individual cell population. But um, it's also compatible with um, this imaging modality is compatible with uh, you know intact tissue as well. Uh, so you know if we have a slide adapter. So if you have tissues that can go onto slides, we can hold four slides at a time and go around an image. And so absolutely 100% compatible. And it's it's really something that's not done as much as it should because you can get all that multiplexing in to get really at the spatial relationship between different cell types and tissues. And so that's what the Hyperion is really good. So once you, you know, you know, at, at, once you exhaust, this is, you know, following on to Brian's thought here, is that, you know, what happens when you need to go big? And um, the next thing is you go to the Hyperion. So the Hyperion is, um, it's an imaging mass cytometer. There's one here at North Campus. We've done one experiment on it with a colleague, Kelly Cushing, and we've done the data analysis, you know, the image analysis from that with a set of about um, about 15 labels. It can go up to 135, right, but they have certain validated antibodies that they've, they've already, the problem is developing the protocol for staining for, they say 135 things. So where that limit comes in is murder. Yeah, it's that's the practical limit's probably something like 30, where you're gonna get yeah, good. Yeah, I was gonna guess 25 or 30. Yeah. And so how it works is that it's it's a it's a, a basically a, a rastering um, a, a Maldi uh, mass spec, and so instead of attaching a fluorophore to a secondary antibody, you covalently attach either a lanthanide or actinide series element, which all have unique masses. And so once the, the cells get ablated, those go down um, to the time of flight, um, and you you detect. Those, those those rare elements. You use a computer to map the spectra back into it. And, it. and it gets put back together as an image, right? And then there's an equivalent to this, which is the Cytoff, um, and so that is the Helios. So the Helios is the flow cytometry version, where you can do um, yeah, you know, just see. flow cytometry and the well, same other, detection modality. Other information. Yeah. So this came out of a high content group at Stanford. Charge range. Yeah, and and uh, you know the company was then bought. So this was a spin out from Stanford University from the high content group there, and uh, and then the, the company was purchased by uh, by Fluidyme, yes. and uh, and now it's in production mode and it's still it's underutilized and it's here. The scans take a long time, so you know it can take three hours for a for a single image, um, to you know so the throughput's very low, but the spectral density is really high. So this is another option when you need to go um, go large in terms of of, of spectral density and, and multiplexing. That's the that's the thing. So. Uh, so we're very well set up to do this kind of a, a microscopy here. So just real quick, I wanted to break down some of those sort of um, conventional assay types. That this is how we sort of think about. Okay, we're, we've got we've got some cellular system. We're interested in some disease, and we're going to um, you know develop an assay. And so these are kind of the assays that are. Um, uh, this is how how they how they break down for us, right? There's a couple of videos here, but um, the first and sort of the easiest to understand are the um, the the assays that are the cellular assays that just involve um, a change of intensity um, of a particular probe. So the probe goes up, the probe goes down. You can do these kinds of assays on plate readers generally, and uh, so they're 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 amenable to that. Um, but they also work very well because you get spatial distribution of the signal inside the cell, which you know can be very important. So the kind of experiments that you can't do on a plate reader. Are these fluorescent? Where you're looking at the distribution of the fluorescence, so like the classic NF kappa B translocation assay, where it's like it's in the cytosol, and then when this activation happens, you get this particular stimulus. All of a sudden, it all dives into the nucleus. You see that. So um, that's that's a, a the classic cytoplasmic nucleus translocation assay. This was a probe that we developed that was actually labeling insulin, so we could look at live beta cells and watch insulin granule trafficking. Um, of course, what everybody's staring at are these worms. <laughs> so I probably shouldn't have pressed play on that because everybody's looking at the worms. Um, so this worm, um, we also developed a worm motility assay. This was funny. So Brian mentioned a little bit about about um, my entrepreneurial spirit, and um, and so it's true. I, I but this one I got burned bad. So I developed this assay for a drug company. Um, they said, like, they had this machine. It was a million-dollar machine. They had very low throughput. This company was called Synexus, and they're no longer around. They were actually purchased um, for a single asset, and then they shut the whole company down. And um, anyway, they um, 
Yeah, yeah, it was a, a single asset company. They, they looked better. They, that's exactly what they did. They buried the project. They had an antifungal, and then they were bought by Pfizer, who had a better pro, you know, a better thing, and they just bought them. Last night, I was sitting with a guy. Somebody spent twelve million to kill him. Just kill him. Yep. You no longer a problem. So they had this antifungal, but then they had this whole research division, and they were interested in, uh, you know, in 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 ag biotech. And so one of the big problems is is you know is is the uh, is nematode infections and you know ruminants, right, in cows and sheep and. And so um, they they wanted to develop an imaging based assay. So we did that, and uh, and then we gave it to them, and they I, they made about about 50 million bucks on this on this assay alone because they screened for uh, Bayer crop sciences. They screened for uh, Monsanto. Monsanto was their was their big big customer, and they they build like crazy for this assay. So in retrospect, so, it was not one of my better businesses. This is, um... <laughs> This gets to some of the live cell or vital imaging yep. area. So these assay types are, you know, you run one at a time kind of thing, and they have different protocols. Yeah, so this assay, um, it's in a 96 well format, so it's not as high throughput. It's not 384. But um, we spend only um, two seconds per well. So, yes, yeah. we're, we're, we're drop compounds. It's effectively an endpoint assay. Because we come back and look at them, see if they're see if they're moving or not. So we have we had a mutual information approach to detecting whether or not the video stack was changing, and it was dead easy, and it it's the, it, yeah. it just worked incredibly well. It was extremely robust, and so you just come back and just take, you know, ten or fifteen frames in a well, right. and you can see if they're live or dead. And there was there's no die here, right? It was dead easy. So that's another. Uh... Yeah, and it, it it would take them uh, several hours to image one plate, and it it uh, this was like around five between five and ten minutes, right? So it just no, up their productivity. And then of course, you know, lately uh, w there's been a lot of action in, in 3D imaging just because of the advent of um, very um, physiologically relevant culture systems like uh, like you know IPS derived human organoids. So we've got one of the best labs you know in the world here. From J we've got Jason Spence here who. Has made significant contributions. He figured out how to make all the the GI based organoids from IPS. So like he figured out how to do that science, um, and so that was really neat. So we we are also um, compatible with with three D imaging, and um, and so sometimes we take the organoid apart, disperse it into um, into cells, and then and then plate them, and then we can see every cell with uh, very very nice and spread out, right? Uh, or sometimes we can just look at. Uh, in, in this case, they're intact, and you can see the signals. If you're just looking for brightness, signal intensities, then uh, 3D imaging is great. But it's a, uh, as you might imagine, it adds a whole another dimension of complexity, right? And uh, and so yeah, now you're dealing so with volumes instead of uh, instead so of 2D images. Get into some uh, green drive, the uh, fan for the, you know, the uh, that uh, opioid slash psilocybin slash. You know, I mean, We're gonna have all the drugs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. And, and of the of the different tissues, because of the importance of, of, of neuro, they're probably the best developed. Vern, I mean, you might be able to, to comment on that. What's your what's your opinion on the status of the of the you know brain brain organoid models? I don't have a good view of them yet. I mean, I imagine they're still technically challenging to get, but yeah, there are people on campus it's who kind, know what's yeah. going some guys on. Guys down in Ohio State. I actually, I do know. Yeah, I mean, there's yeah. been other places close by that have been pretty. So that's just some, that would be a nice little discussion to have and see maybe we can you know, go down the street since we got walled once again. <laughs> <laughs> we need a brain trap. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so we're, we're primarily a liver lab. We, we, we're in GI, um, and, and so we're working on. Uh, uh, there's a brand new protocol from Takabe in Cincinnati um, to, to develop liver organoids, and so um, this is sort of the first. And this was just dropped a couple of months ago, so we jumped right on it. So we're we're in in the process of making them from IPS. So now we can make you know basically very small livers from any person from a dermal fibroblast, um, and you know it's actually kind of simple. It's you know we add a hepatocyte growth factor, and then wait five days, and then add retinoic acid. And then wait another dozen days or so, and then and then that's the that's all the signaling cues that you need to make hepatocytes, uh, the liver resident macrophages called Cooper cells, and then also the 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 pro fibrotic um, 
myofibroblasts, right? They're called the hepatic stellate cells. So um, anyway, this is just a little landscape of, 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 of drug discovery and drug development assays. And so there's biological compl complexity. So, you know, over here, the easiest are the biochemical assays. And, and sort of the, this is sort of the assay format. And here, the web level averaged, that's where most drug discovery has been done heretofore, right? And so with the advent of, of high throughput imaging, this, the complexity really took off. So we went from biochemical assays to phenotypic assays and cancer cells, right? So now we can do targeted, you know, and phenotypic assays in, in, you know, highly proliferating cells. So you've got cancer cells. You can also take primary cells that proliferate from patients. And then all the way up through, you know, terminally differentiated cells through IPS protocols where it's now the cells are a little bit more rare and harder to come by. And then, you know, the spheroids now, if you take cancer cells, you can grow them out into spheroids that are pretty easy. That's pretty easy to do. And then, you know, the organoids that have very complex structures. Um, so that's just, you know, sort of the, the spectrum of complexity. And then, you know, from well level to multiplexed imaging all the way up to cell painting. That's where, you know, we must be sick puppies because, you know, we went straight to the upper, upper right corner there with cell painting in these human, you know, IPS derived uh, organoids. And so this is a picture of a, of, a, of a little organoid. And so this was just to see, cap, capture the stem cell population. And so, um, you know, the, the green signal here is KI67, and it's very easy to take a picture of this. Not, this is not 3D, this is just 2D. And then it's very straightforward to just classify those cells. So how many, you know, how, how many cells do we have are proliferative in this, um, in this well? So this is a very basic analysis, but um, it's good. Yeah, yeah, there's plenty of structure there. And so, you know, this was really a volume. This is just a, a, a slice through the middle. Yeah. And you can, you can analyze these as individual slices throughout the whole stack, or you can build them as a volume. And so Ann Carpenter, um, you know, who makes the cell, the cell, cell profiler software, Right. is just about to release a new big version that, that handles 3D better. Um, so the previous version handles 3D some, to some extent, but um, it's, it's really sort of natively going to handle voxels. And so um, it's, it's, a, it's an important thing. So um, speaking of which, so the, the cell painting thing came out. And so just to, to, to tell you a definition of what cell painting is. So it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's throwing spaghetti at the wall, you know, and, and – approach. You're just trying to measure as many things as you can, and then you're going to go back through with informatics in the back end and figure out what was important based on whatever ground truth or treatment or genetic perturbations that you're doing. And so, um, and so that's like part of the assay development part. So there's a sort of a standard die set. So the sta this is the standard die set from Ann Carpenter's lab. Um, <clears throat> and it was, uh, it was like five dies. It's pretty, it's pretty easy to accomplish, and it was in U2OS cells. So some people think that um, this, if, when you say cell painting, you think that it's these exact five dyes in U2OS cells, which are these osteosarcoma cells are like um, that specific format. But really, cell painting is a broader, um, you know, term for just comprehensive morphologic characterization of cells in a dish, right? We want to add as many probes as possible to capture as much information as we can about that cell population so we can use that to inform decisions for, you know, drug discovery, drug development, or whatever the biological questions may be. So here you see it, you've got a, a control and a drug treated. So this would be a vehicle control like our DMSO control, and then we have a drug treated, and you can see the differences are there, right? And then the point is that we have to actually quantitate those differences. So um, depending on the assay and depending on what your area of biology is or your interest, you can label various different cellular compartments, right? And so we have a huge array of small molecule dyes, um, and then, of course, you, you, you can, you know, supplement that with, with, with primary secondary antibody systems <clears throat> or primary conjugated antibodies to um, label pretty much whatever you want. Yeah. So brief note for all the bioinformatician students in the room, this is going to produce data that looks a lot like single-cell RNA-seq, but it doesn't have the, the unfortunate zero inflation. There are, there are not cells that don't have a radius that you then have to impute or yeah, so that data is very sparse. This data is no. not sparse at all. There's, there's no, I mean, I don't know, what, what's the, Reed, do you have an estimate for the um, sparseness of the data? It's like. Less than 1%, barely anything. Yeah, so that's a really important point. Yeah, thanks, Sam. So, um, yeah, so this is a, just, this slide serves no purpose other than to just 
<laughs> dazzle you with uh, with cellular segmentation. Look at it, look at them. So these cells were particularly fun because they would stretch out and just do ridiculous stuff. And we can capture all of it, right? And so these guys are dropping focal adhesions and stress fibers and all kinds of crazy stuff, and we're able to just capture all of it. So this is the this is you know just a, a, a three color image, and then these are the uh, the three regions of interest that we identified, and then these are the radial distribution plots of those signals. And so this just carves the cell up into concentric circles, and so we can measure you know under different treatment conditions how does the shape of this you know this radial distribution curve change, right? So it just generates a huge amount of data, and it's data that we're not still not quite we're not fully leveraging the, um, you know, the, the the complexity of this data yet. But like, you know, you gotta you gotta build up to it. Yeah. Oh, so is the segmentation done using cell profiler? This was, yeah, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. M most of the time, we're using cell profiler. Okay. Um, here's just a few cool things that have happened in the literature recently. So one was that um, is Google Google and UCSF team, they did a um, uh, an assessment of of uh, Primary cells. These were these were just fibroblasts from patients, and some of them were healthy, and some of them had um, spinal muscle atrophy, right? So SMA, and it's it's a uh, these cells were fibroblasts. They weren't neurons, and they weren't muscle cells or anything like that. But what they found was that if they they could take uh, cells from these patients and train a a, a convolutional neural network. And they got very, very good separation between those populations. So they could tell from an unrelated cell type who had spinal muscle atrophy and who didn't, right? And it was pretty impressive. So, um, so there's, here's the reference here. Um, this was in SLAS Discovery just in 2019. Um, but one of the most important things that came out of this paper was um, they had another ConvNet learner that they published that's broadly applicable that we can use to identify and then reject out-of-focus cells. So sometimes you take a whole field of cells and you'll have one cell that's lifting off or for some reason it's, there was an you know, artifact in the plate and it's not in focus. And you don't want to pollute your data with out-of-focus cells because they really mess up the measurement, right? And so if you have, um, you know, a lot of times we're, we do a lot of spot counting. So when we're counting and identifying spots, if you think about mitochondria, we're trying to count and identify them and measure attributes about them. Well, guess what mitochondria look like when they're just a little bit out of focus? They're just huge, blurry, you know, smooshy, and they just don't look very nice, right? So it, out of focus mitochondria also look like depolarized mitochondria. So it's, yeah, it's tough. So if you can have a good metric for rejecting um, or at least weighting your results based on the um, the focus of an individual cell at the cell level, really powerful. So this is a very nice tool that allows us to clean up our data sets. And then this was a this was kind of a neat one. This was mapping the perturbome, and I really dislike that word. It just is icky. Like the perturbome. Matt, Matt O'Meara showed us this paper, I think. Anyway, this was really nice. Is this showing this? So so we we can do these kinds of, of we do these kinds of experiments. So what we can do is we can take any cell system and we can screen it through our drug repurposing library. So in this case, are we after drug repurposing? No. What are we after? We're after all the potential pharmacologic perturbations of a cell that you can see. And so if a cell has a receptor or doesn't have a receptor that this drug is hitting, you'll see an effect or not an effect. You want to know if this drug is perturbing your cells in this manner, right? And then as compound concentration goes up, then they're just generally perturbing cells through xenobiotic toxicity. And it's like, you know, it's, I think my dad said this to me one time. It's like even a Nerf bat can be lethal if you use it, you know, appropriately, right, or hard enough, I think. Yeah. That was my dad. <clears throat> okay. I, so, I don't think you know how many people know what Nerf is. <laughs> oh, yeah, no. It's, it's still around. It's still around. It's still yeah. around. Yeah. Nerf, bat, Nerf guns are the thing. I don't, there's not many Nerf bats around. There's Nerf swords. Nerf sword. <laughs> I should change my update my uh, my meme. Yeah, yeah. So you can take a, um, our drug repurposing set and get a perturbation map and characterize every perturbation, basically the every pharmacologic perturbation that exists um, in in uh, in about 
you know, in, in 17 plates worth of, of screening, which is not a lot. These guys that did this in a batch, they did that in one day, right, in a cell-based assay, screened 5,000 compounds in, one, in, in just one batch, in a single batch, which was really amazing. I would prefer that they do that all the time because then we don't have any batch-to-batch -batch variability, right? But I don't know. More complex assays. That was an easy assay. So anyway, um, now, uh, now that our pizza's in the process of digesting, yeah, now we're doing the fatty liver, right? and our, the triglycerides are going to our liver, this is what happens when you're in chronic overnutrition. So um, chronic overnutrition, right, is the, it, it's just, it's crazy that we have to go about this for, you know, from the drug discovery angle, but we really do. This may be one of those addiction things where ayahuasca might help us uh, do what, this is now, this is for my father-in-law. He says, all you need, all, only thing you need is you need a drug that just makes you lay down your fork. Yeah, right. That's all you need is just to lay down the fork. And, and then this goes away. Anyway, this is a fatty liver. And so, you know, a nice, healthy red liver looks like this. And, uh, and what happens is that when you're in chronic overnutrition, instead of your fat going to your adipose tissue where it should go, your adiposity can't expand quickly enough, and so it starts to go to your organ systems. And one place that it's really harmful is in uh, in your liver. And so this is what a fatty liver looks like. If you are a fan of French food, you will recognize this as foie gras. This is where they force feed ducks or geese carbohydrates. So they force feed them corn, and their livers get super fat and also delicious. This does not look delicious, however. Um, you have to saute. So <laughs> what's Stunning about this condition is that a hundred million Americans have this, and this, this is, is absolutely a huge problem. problem in Asia as well. In China is terrible, and in Asia it's harder to detect because I can spot somebody with fatty liver disease from like 15 paces, but the Asian phenotypes are a little different, right? And so they don't manifest with the, skinny the waist the to hip rate on the outside, fat on the inside. That's what they call it, oh, Sophie. Yeah. Skinny outside, fat inside. Yeah. It's a different. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a big problem worldwide, but the, literally a third of America has it. So this is bad. Um, and so but with a third of America having this, you know, there's somewhere between, you know, 10 to 20 percent of those patients develop scar tissue in their liver. The fat by itself, just, you know, despite looking really bad, doesn't actually, it's, these patients are just asymptomatic, right? And uh, it, it only becomes harmful when they progress to forming scar tissue in their liver. So this is liver fibrosis. So you really need three things. You need the fat to be present. You need um, uh, an inflammatory response to all that fat. And then, and then that's when myofibroblast proliferation happens. And these cell cells start um, secreting collagen. And that's the scar tissue. And at that point, the hepatocytes start to die. And you end up with this super tough, um, uh, you know, sort of gristly liver, right? It just doesn't. Um, doesn't have any hepatocytes anymore, so hepatic pressure goes down and down. So this is the, the, the at the histological level, so this is H&E stained um, slides. This is a healthy liver, right? So you can see the vasculature, you can see pleural vein, bile duct, you know, central vein. And, uh, and this is what it looks like when it's fat, okay? And you can see that um, there's, fat manifests in a couple of different ways here. There's macrovesicular steatosis and micro. And so that's the little tiny bubbles. And so we know that this fat, deposits in, in inside hepatocytes and also outside of hepatocytes. And so um, we built a model uh, system to assess that steatosis endpoint. That's just one of the three sort of pathogenic targets that we're after here. So we picked a cancer cell line. Actually, it's not a cancer cell line. It's a non-neoplastic but immortalized hepatocyte model called PH5CHA. We developed assay around it, and this is the, I know we're running out of time here, so. No, you got 10 minutes. Um, I got to go teach. Thank you, sir. Good to see everybody. Johnny, beautiful job. Thank you. I'm not even done yet. <laughs> <laughs> Grill them at the end. Got it. Please do. And, uh, and so, you know, we, we developed the assay, we developed the probe set, and then the image analysis. And, um, and ultimately, we get to the point where we can do a screen. And so we screened our drug repurposing library. So this was done, you know, in I think the course of about six weeks. Um, and so it was 17 plates, 4,700 drugs to be specific, of six fields per well, five colors, 12 megabytes per image. It was 1.5 terabytes of data, image data. And so what does the output data look like? Well, it's 2,000 columns, and that's the number of primary features. And there were, uh, there were I think there were 8 million rows. 
So that's, um, that's the whole data set, right? And uh, it turns out to be a single 100 gigabyte CSV file. So that's just the text data. So it's like, yeah, <laughs> but I need some bigger glasses to, you know, it's just a literally a wall of data. So this is absolutely uninterpretable. So um, anyway, these are, uh, these are read slides. So I wanted to provide some sample data. So here's another URL. So you can go and fetch a plateful of, of, uh, of you know, high content, you know, cell profile or output, just in case for you data, for you data jockeys, um, you know, you're welcome to go and, and pull this down. And then this was a, um, came from a publicly accessible image set, but the data we, we generated using a cell profile pipeline. So um, if you're interested to see it, this, this is a, an example to, to, to get your hands on some of that data. Um, so the data analysis is super important for this. We have um, this data workflows that we build, and we use an open source platform called NIME. So, so Cell Profile are also open source, and NIME is a data analytics platform that is also that manages workflows. It's also open source. So um, I'm just going to kind of fly through this stuff here. Um, and if you have um, you know any questions, feel free to stop me. But um, basically, what we do is we come out with this kind of data from a CSV file. Uh, we take it into NIME. We get one data file per compartment. So we'll have one that relates to the nucleus, one relates to the cytoplasm, one relates to you know, each compartment. We get one output CSV. Those have to be all joined together. So there's a data architecture component here. We have to um, you know, strap all that information together with the metadata. What well, what row, what column was it in, and what drug was it treated with, right? And then so we have a whole workflow. So we're actually just about to publish this in the uh, we just wrote a chapter for the NIH Asset Guidance Manual, and the, all of this is going to be publicly available, and I'm happy to send this out as a follow-up email once it gets published. So it'll be part of the NIH bookshelf on how to, you know, do high-content data analysis, right? So we have, um, once we assemble the big data table, then we go start assessing the signals there, and we've got, you know, Z prime as a uh, sort of a plate-based quality. If the Z prime is not good, then we know we have to repeat that plate. We don't use it for a whole lot else. Um, then in comes the machine learning. So in this particular um, platform, we're using um, a cost-sensitive random forest classifier. So um, we, we worked with Arvind Rao in this department to help um, you know, really fine-tune this classifier here, and it, and it worked um, incredibly well. So this is the scatter plot from the screen. So when we do a, a high-throughput screen like this, um, this was actually, so this is Jesse's work right here. This is Jesse's work. So we like to pick one understandable feature um, from a screen like this. And this is the number of lipid droplets per cell. So we actually labeled all the lipid droplets there, tabulated them, and this is sort of the average here. And so you'll see this is negative control. That's positive control. So what we're trying to achieve is a lower fat cell. We're trying to get, uh, we're trying to discover a drug that can defat the cell, right, to make it healthy again. So that's the positive control. And then this is all the compound screening data. What do you see? You see lots of compounds that make it worse. You see some compounds that make it better. Um, and then, so this is actually a distance score. So this inverts the situation here. So this is a, uh, this is basically a p-value score for the probability that a cell belongs to the positive control group, right? So this is, this is biased, highly biased against the controls, and we have unbiased ways also. But what you can see is that this is a multivariate score, okay? And you can see that the negative control is here, and the positive control is here. Look at all the daylight between those signals. So this is really one of the amazing things about building, about using machine learning and screening data. You go from a situation like this, where you can see there's fairly clear overlap there, right? to a situation where there's just, there's just miles apart and these distributions don't even touch. So, um, so it's, it's really nice that, that um, we are developing these machine learning tools to help us um, bootstrap our way from sort of marginal um, features up to you know, very robust scoring systems where we can really detect some interesting stuff. So we do hit picking based on the positive control and also based on the um, you know, just distance scoring. So most of the distance hits that we get are cytotoxic compounds. So if you have a whole population of healthy cells and then you have a well that looked like a nuclear bomb went off and, and there's like nobody there or there's a little bit of debris, that results in a very large distance. And so we have to, you know, filter out those um, uh, those large distance hits to get after. You know, we're trying to find drugs that also make them do interesting things, right? 
So we found a compound that like made them like grow out little neurites. And that's really interesting. So we're, of course, we're going after the, the therapeutic goal here of defatting the liver, but um, we've got a lot to follow up on. So one of these, a screen like this can just generate, it generates, you know, hypotheses like you would not believe. It can keep the whole team busy for, you know, probably for 10 years, I think. So, um, yeah, this is a couple, just a couple of visualizations here. So one of the compounds that came out of the screen was called rosiglitazone. It was no, no surprise that, um, a, you know, a diabetes drug would help it would improve um, uh, fatty liver disease and it's actually been shown to have a marginal effect in clinical trials anyway this is what we affectionately call a wiggle plot it, and so <laughs> this is funny so this is leveraging the cell painting data now so what we're doing is we're looking in the lipid compartment the endoplasmic reticulum mitochondria cytoskeleton okay and the fatty hepatocyte has this phenotypic fingerprint okay and then the reference fingerprint for the healthy hepatocyte, we just set to zero, okay? So this is disease state and flatline is healthy. And you can see that rosiglitazone, um, it helps in most of these categories, right? And then when we're doing new drug discovery, we can go lock on to these phenotypic signatures so that now when we discover something new, we can impute what a, you know, a potential pharmacologic effect. Sam, you look like you have a question. That overcorrection in the ER, I guess it's borderline significant. I don't know if, if that's known physiologically why insulin signaling is doing that, but that is very interesting. Yep, exactly. That's the kind of things. That, so now we know that we need to be looking at ER biology now, right? We had a, another compound that was, that was a smoking gun was the mitochondria you know, compartment. So we immediately are going after respiration and mitochondrial uncoupling and or you know some other effects that are you know related to the mitochondria and that really um, is the big one of the big advantages of this technique is that not only do we get a hit but we get a lot of nuance to that hit and we get some information and we can make some good hypotheses just from this primary screening data so really fun um, I'm gonna skip this this is quantitative histomorphometry so basically you know we developed a similar approach to analyzing the in vivo results so we put compounds in animals all the time and um, we can uh, put a, you know, the normal pathologist score is pretty crude. Um, and we have pipelines set up to score all of this. And so, of course, we've got ground truth from a, a pathologist score here. We can see very nice, uh, you know, 0.96 R squared value, which in my opinion is probably too high. I think we're biased, right? I think pathologists can't, pathologists can't even agree that much to that extent. So this is agreement with a single pathologist. So we they have some bias there, but <clears throat> in any case, works very well, and it turns a zero to three steatosis score into a continuous variable, which is really nice for um, detecting subtle effects. Because sometimes these effects are subtle, and we want to use that as a starting point to, you know, develop that. So we're right in the middle of this drug development, drug discovery process, and then uh, we're we're hoping to have clinically testable hypotheses very very soon. And so lots of these drugs are FDA approved. And they can potentially be tested off-label directly in phase 2B clinical trials, right? Phase 2A, phase 2B clinical trials. Um, real quick, uh, epidermolysis below. So this is where we took a, a patient cell and we de detected a phenotype. Can you see the difference between these two phenotypes? So this is a, a cytoskeletal defect. And it, it, this is a healthy cell. This is a disease cell. So we trained a machine learner on that, and, um, and we were able to, uh, again, we screened the whole library, and uh, we were able to find compounds that would take the cell, this is a time series here, would take the cells from, from this to extensive keratin bundling. So this is a keratin-5 mutant. So this is epidermolysis bullosa. So we found two drugs that are very promising, and they're both FDA-approved, commonly prescribed. So right now, what we're doing is we're trying to find enough. Of, we're trying to find some of these patients so that we can actually uh, do um, an ex, either an expanded access or an off-label kind of a, a you know proof of concept study here. So that that was that was really a, a really a, a neat result, and it was the the the, the product of, of drug repurposing and machine learning finding a phenotype. Okay, so this is my last slide. Sorry, I just wanted to show you this because you don't see UMAP plots for cellular phenotype, usually. Usually these are transcriptomic profiles, right? But this is what we can do. 
So this was a fairly simple assay, but um, it's, again, morphologic profiling of a very complex um, cellular population, right? So this was from, um, from human intestinal organoids. And, uh, and so basically, we can make these UMAP plots. We don't fully understand what these populations represent, but what we did here is that we added a perturbation. So Barrett's esophagus is like, you get gastric reflux, then you get Barrett's esophagus, it's like horrible morphologic changes in your esophagus, and then that leads to esophageal adenocarcinoma. And so for some reason, Caucasians get this really bad. Uh, African-Americans totally protected from it. The incidence is like nil, right? This is one of the most prominent health disparities, I think. It's, it's up there, right, Justin? It's high. It's high. So this was really interesting. Um, what, what happened was, so we did some clustering here. So in the untreated, so we've got African-American and a Caucasian, this is like six and six um, donors, right? And what, when we try to set up a classifier, we basically are not, we don't do a very good job at detecting who is African-American in a dish, right? Or who's Caucasian in a dish. But once we perturb them with bile acid, they segregate. Each, sorry, is each row a cell at this point? Each row is a cell. Okay. Yeah, and this, this, this clade here is, that's all Caucasian. And what you see here that's interesting is that you have some cells. The only problem with this data is that some of the cells are misclassified as, uh, as Caucasian. But, you know, you know, ethnic demographic is self-reported, and it's not, it's not binary, right? And so what's interesting is, is that this is probably the Caucasian variant bleeding into the African-American um, phenotype, right? So this is a really neat thing. And what's powerful about this is that we can make these TISNI and UMAP plots, and we can lasso a set of cells here, and we get the image. And we can look at exactly what those cells look like. And so that's really powerful. That's the connector that's missing in single cell transcriptomics, is the facial connection between groups, and then also just the ability to, to inspect a cluster and look and see what their phenotype is, right? So you very often see a, you know, the, all the mitotic cells go out this way and you know, different cell types, you know, cluster in different areas. But what this color map is here is the bile acid treatment. So when we take the cell population and treat them with bile acids, they go along this very defined trajectory and they produce this different phenotype. That phenotype treated looks like that and then untreated. You know, looks like that. So that was my last slide. Sorry for the data dump, but um, I'd just like to say uh, thanks to you know Brian A. who just stepped out for inviting me, and to um, collaborators and uh, and to everybody in my lab. A couple of people are here. So thank you. That was me when I joined University of Michigan <laughs> two years ago. <laughs> That's me now. <laughs> and then. This is an extrapolation, but this may be two years. This I, I was horrified when I saw this. I'm like, oh, Jesus, that, that is what I'm going to look like. This is the power of AI. Is, this is de it's dead on. And, and so, you know what? These are all the 23-year-old graduate students in my lab, so we made them old, too. So this is, this is, this is Reed, yeah. Shawnee Sean, that's Jesse right there, Jesse and his wife. And so anyway. Uh, to play that game. <laughs> anyway, I'm very happy to take any questions you might have. If you want to go back to anything specific, happy to. Questions? Yes. Best way to link gene or protein expression to these thousand cell painting features. Is there any way to do that? Yeah, so we're, we're working on that. <clears throat> um, so uh, there's a couple of different ways. So. One is you can perturb cellular phenotype with a, a known pharmacologic agent, and that is hitting a specific receptor that's hitting a specific target, um, whatever it is, and it's causing some perturbation shift that you can detect, right? And the other, the other way to do that, like if you're thinking about, like, okay, I have a diverse cell population here, and I want to be able to say who's who, then usually what we would do in that case is we would do a, a, um, a series of, of antibody labeling experiments where we'll label specific epitopes so that we can see where they land on, um, on the TISNI or UMAP plot, right? And then uh, we can say, oh, okay, this is the epithelial cell cluster. And then what we'll do is we just figure out what morphologic characteristics correlate with that antibody signal, and now we can drop the antibody going forward because we've localized them. We've characterized them. So really, 
you know, the transcriptomics is, is like, it's, it's great. It's just, it's just not, what really matters is the phenotype and we can have direct access to that in this kind of thing. So once we learn what cell markers go along with the phenotype, then we can drop the cell markers and just, and just go at them straight from the phenotype, right? And so usually we can get that with just one or two channels. Nuclear size, nuclear texture, and just the cell size and shape. You know, it's like you can get, you can get all of them. You can, you can get them all clustered and classified like that. And then there's just so many more dimensions that are, that are available there to do more analysis. But it just takes a couple of dimensions to get that kind of, a, get that level of, a, of, of insight into the, into, into a complex culture, you know, model like this. Does that answer your question? Yeah. How many, what, like, what's the maximum number of genes? mentioned going after specific epitopes, is that like yeah. two or four? Genes? Well, it really depends on the question. I mean, what you, you know, the, we, we don't really know. This has not been done um, super extensively. So uh, that's where the Hyperion comes in, right? So with the Hyperion, you can learn on that data where it's really highly multiplex, where you can look at 30 genes at a time. So for inflammatory cell signaling and inflam just characterizing different inflammatory cell types, you know, they're going to have, I think they have a panel up there. They're working on it. There's a, like I think the last time, the last data set I saw was was like uh, eight or ten colors that were labeling CD45 positive and a couple of different other you know other markers. And then and then once you once you sort of get once you get that data, you can you know you can do all the morphometrics and and, and isolate them. But in principle, um, you know you can do several sets of smaller experiments where. You know, you answer the questions you need to know. What does this specific cell type look like? You go stain for the biomarker, stain for that gene, whatever. Or you can do RNA scope as well. So if you want to probe, uh, you know, uh, RNA expression, then you can you can use RNA scope to you know look at a transcript and how that correlates with uh, you know with the cell morphology and everything. That RNA scope, you can do maybe three or four RNA at a time at best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like Suhamu just got that fancy microscope to do deep fish. Start to do like multiplex in I two. Yeah. Whether they, I mean the, the paper says you can do ten thousand different art. Oh yeah, I saw that. Yeah. So given that we're already over the hour, I think Sorry. maybe we should take the rest of the questions offline. Sure. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you again. Yeah. I've been on Brian. He interrupted me like twelve times. <laughs>